In today's video, we're going to learn about the first and second derivative test. Um, the, the first and second derivative test tells us a lot about our function. And also, we're going to, not only focusing on these two tests, but we're actually going to focus on what the first and second um, derivative tells us about the shape of our graph, such as where are the intervals in which the function is increasing or decreasing, what are the intervals in which the function is concave up or concave down, where are the relative maximums at, where are the relative minimum points, where are our points of inflection. All of that will be learned today. So we're going to start by determining the intervals for which a function is increasing or decreasing. To do this, we will first start by finding the critical numbers that we learned in our last section. Remember, you find your critical numbers by setting your derivative equal to zero or um, setting your derivative equal to where the function, the derivative does not exist. Once you find the critical values, we're gonna construct what's called a sign chart. Sign chart is just a chart in which we, we draw a number line. On this number line, we're going to label our critical values, C1, C2, and C3 in increasing order. I'm gonna flag these values because they're important. I wanna make sure I don't lose them or count them as something else. And then um, I'm gonna use this information, these, uh, this sign chart to figure out all kinds of information about my function. First thing we're gonna do is we're gonna figure out about our first derivative and our intervals of increasing or decreasing. So below the number line, I'll have my x values. Above the number line, I'm gonna write my derivative values, positive or negative. And then above that, I'm gonna write, what does that tell me about the original equation? So to answer those questions, let's move to step three. If our derivative is greater than zero, then we know the function is increasing on that interval. So that whole interval, the function will be increasing. If the derivative is less than zero or negative, then the function, the original equation, is decreasing on that interval. Now, right, let's see how this works in this example. So first thing I'm going to do is I need to find my critical numbers. Remember, we find our critical numbers by finding the derivative of our function. So we need to figure out the derivative of f of x. In this case, that will be 12x cubed minus 12x squared minus 24x. Then I'm going to figure out when this derivative does not exist or when it equals zero. Now, because this is a polynomial, it will always exist. So all I have to worry about is when the derivative is equal to zero. I'm going to solve this by factoring. So I'm going to factor out my GCF. And then I'm going to factor the quadratic. Using my zero product rule, I'm going to set each factor equal to zero and solve each little equation. So I have x equals 0, x equals 2, and x equals negative 1. So my critical numbers, putting in increasing order, will be x is equal to negative 1, 0, and 2. So that's the first step. So we completed step 1. Step 2 is we want to draw a sign chart. So to draw a sign chart, I'm going to start by drawing a number line. And on this number line, I'm going to mark my critical value. So I'm going to mark negative 1, 0, and 2. Notice I'm putting these in increasing order. I'm going to flag these critical values as important. All right, now... Notice that my, my x is x of negative 1, 0, and 2 is below the x axis, the number line, and then I have a derivative above it, and then above that I'm going to talk about what that tells me about the function. All right, what's cool about this, notice that I have divided up my number line into four sections. So this orange section is all the numbers less than negative 1. The red section is all the numbers between negative 1 and 0. The blue is all the numbers between um, 0 and 2. And then all the numbers greater than 2 is in the um, green. So my number line is divided up to sections. So to figure out what's happening in each section, all I have to do is set test point. I just choose a number in each of those sections and see what my derivative is. Is it positive or is it negative? So I'm gonna choose in that orange interval, my test point I'm gonna choose will be negative two. So I'm gonna plug that into my derivative. Now you can plug that into any form of the derivative you want. I like to plug it into the, the factored form because it deals with smaller numbers and if you don't have a calculator, it's always nice to plug it into these, to these factors because I don't really care what the number is, I just care if I can get a positive or negative. So if I take negative 12 times, I mean negative two times 12, that gives me a negative value. Negative two minus two is negative and negative two plus one is negative. And I'm multiplying all these together. So a negative times a negative times a negative equals a negative number. So you notice I didn't even care what the number was. So I know my derivative is negative on that interval. And if my derivative is negative from step three, we learned that tells us our function value must be decreasing. All right, now I'm gonna pick a test point in the next interval, some number in between negative one and zero. I'm gonna choose negative one half. Again, plugging that into my derivative equation and evaluating it, really just caring if it's a positive or negative, so I don't have to actually come up the numbers. 12 times a negative um, one half is negative, one half minus two is negative, one half plus one is positive, negative times a negative times a positive equals a positive value. So this interval is positive, derivative is positive, which tells me my function, my original equation must be increasing for that entire interval. Now I'm gonna to move to the blue section. So I'm picking a number in between zero and two, I'll pick one, plug that into my derivative equation, 
And let's see, 12 times one is positive, one minus a two is negative, one plus one is positive, positive times negative times positive is negative. So that tells me my original function must be decreasing on this interval. Okay, last but not least, I need to check the green interval of that number line. So I'm gonna pick a number greater than two, I'll pick three, you can pick any number greater than two, you get the same result. All right, 12 times three is a positive number, three times um, three minus two is positive, two, um, three plus one is positive, positive times positive times positive is positive. So my derivative is positive, my original function is increasing. All right, so the intervals in which this function is increasing, that was our original question, in what intervals is it decreasing? So over here I'm gonna write my increasing intervals. And increasing is um, from the red section, which is from negative one to zero, and the green section, which is from two to infinity. So I'd write this as negative one to zero, union two to infinity. Now I'm gonna find the intervals in which my function is decreasing. Again, I'll refer back to my um, sign chart to figure this out. Okay, according to my sign chart, my function is decreasing from negative infinity up to that negative one critical value and from zero to two. And now you found the intervals in which this function is increasing and the intervals in which this function is decreasing. Now that we've figured out how to do this, I want you to try this example. Pause the video and see what you, how you do. All right, to find our intervals of increasing, first thing I need to do is differentiate my function and find my critical numbers. So let's find the derivative of f of x. And now I'm gonna figure out when that derivative is equal to zero and when that derivative does not exist. But since it's a polynomial, it will always exist. So all I really have to worry about is where it equals zero. And so I'm gonna solve this by factoring. So I'm gonna take out my GCF of six and then I'm gonna factor this quadratic and use the zero product rule and set h factor equal to zero. And I have two critical numbers in this problem, negative one and uh, negative four and positive one. Step two of finding our intervals of increasing or decreasing is make a sign chart. So I'm gonna make my sign chart and on this sign chart, I'm gonna flag my critical numbers of negative one and four in increasing order. Now I've labeled the, below the, the number line as my x, right above it as my derivative and right above that, I'm gonna talk about what that tells me about the function. So I have divided up this number line into three equal sections. So I'm gonna start by finding um, the first section in green here. And so I'm gonna plug into the derivative um, f of negative five and so again, you can use any one you want. I like, personally, I like using the factored form. Um, and so I just have six is positive, negative five plus four is negative, negative five minus one is negative, which multiplying those together gives me a positive value. So that tells me my original function is increasing for all numbers less than negative four. Now for my next interval, I'm gonna choose a number between negative four and one, I'm gonna choose zero. Plug that into my derivative. And I get six is still positive, positive and then negative and positive times positive times a negative is negative. So that tells me my original function is decreasing on this interval. Last, I'm gonna plug into my derivative the um, number greater than one, and I'm gonna choose two. Six is still positive, two plus four is positive, two minus one is positive, positive times positive times positive is positive. So if my derivative is positive, my original function is increasing. Now I'm gonna put this together and write my answer. So the intervals in which my function is increasing is from negative infinity to negative four, the green area, and union one to infinity, the purple. And the intervals in which the function is decreasing is the red, which is from negative four to one. That's how you find the intervals in which a function is increasing or decreasing. Next, we're gonna use something called the first derivative test. The first derivative test lets us figure out where our local extremas, our relative max or mins, or our local max and mins are located on our graph. All right, so how do we do the first derivative test? Okay. First derivative test is you're gonna find your critical number. So you always start by finding your critical numbers. If your derivative changes from increasing to decreasing at that critical value of C, then F has a local maximum at C. If the derivative changes, oh, and here, look at our last example that we just did. We went from increasing to decreasing and um, so at negative four, we have a local maximum. So from our sign chart, we can see that we have a local maximum at an X value of negative four. Usually you'll find the Y value, but I'm just not gonna do it here since that's not part of the problem. Now, how do we figure out our local minimum? Well, our local minimum occurs when, if the derivative changes from decreasing to increasing at a critical number C. If that happens, we know F has a local minimum at that critical value of C.
So in our last example, um, we were going from decreasing to increasing. So one would be a local minimum. So there's a local minimum at S equals one from our last example. Now, I usually don't worry about memorizing in, you know, maximum if the um, increasing, decreasing, minimum is decreasing, increasing. I use the sign chart help me figure it out. One important thing to note, sometimes we do not switch signs at critical values. So if, this, if the derivative does not change at your critical number C, it's neither a max nor a min. So for example, you might have a positive interval and a and positive interval, and so you have no local extrema at that point. Like I said, the best way to find this information is to use your sign chart. And notice how I drew the arrows decreasing, I drew an arrow going down, increasing, I drew an arrow going up. I physically formed a maximum point and a minimum point in my little diagram below my sign chart. If you do that, it'll help you out every time. So let's um, do an example. Let's find the local extrema of f of x. So first step to find the extrema of this is we need to find our critical numbers. So we find our critical numbers by finding our first derivative. So my first derivative of, of this function is um, x cubed plus 2x squared minus 3x. Then I figure out when the derivative equals 0. The derivative does not exist. Well, it's a polynomial, so it will always exist. So I just have to worry about when it is equal to 0. Again, I'm going to solve by factoring. And I find that I have critical numbers at 0, negative 3, and 1. All right, now I know my critical numbers at negative 3, 0, and 1. I'm going to make my sign chart flagging those critical numbers. I have divided up my, my, um, sign, my, num my number line into four segments. So I need to do test points in each segment. So picking a number less than negative 3, I'll choose negative 4. And plug that into my derivative equation. Again, it doesn't matter which one. I personally like to plug it into our factored form but you have to be confident you're doing your factoring correctly. And let's see, I got negative, negative, negative. So negative times negative positive, positive times negative is negative. So um, that tells me my original function is decreasing. Let's get the labeling. You always have to label your sign chart. I forgot to do it. Okay, now I'm gonna look at my next interval and that's from negative three to zero. So I'm gonna choose a number between negative three and zero. Um, let's say negative one. I get negative times a positive, times a negative, and so that gives me a positive value. So that gives me, I know my function is increasing on that interval. Okay, now the red interval from zero to one, I'll choose one half, plugging that into my derivative. And I end up with a negative value. So yes, my function is decreasing. Last interval is all numbers greater than one. I'll choose two. And that gives me a positive value. So my function is increasing. So to figure out my extremas, I am going to expand my, my sign chart by drawing arrows. The number is decreasing in the purple interval. So that means I need to be drawing a number down. It's increasing, so arrow up, decreasing, arrow down, increasing, arrow up. So notice I've automatically drawn uh, minimum values at negative three and one, and a maximum value at zero. So when it says to find your local extremas, it wants the point in which um, the local max or min point. So we have to write our answer as a point. So that means I need to figure out my um, function value at those critical numbers. So my next step is to take my critical numbers and plug it into my original function. So I'm gonna replace every x in f of x with negative three. Next, I'm gonna replace every x with zero. And finally, replacing every x in my original function with 1. Therefore, I can conclude that this function has a local maximum at the point 0, 2. And it has two local minimums. One local minimum at negative 3, comma, negative um, 37 fourths. And at the point 1, comma, 17 twelfths. All right, now I want you to try one. See how you did on this one. We're going to find the extremas on f of x is equal to negative x squared minus x plus 2. So to find your local extremas for the first derivative test, the first thing you do is find your derivative. And then we're going to find our critical numbers by setting that derivative to where it does not exist, but it's polynomial, so it always exists, and setting it equal to 0. Solving this, I get that I have one critical number, and it's at x equals negative 1 half. So I'm going to draw a number line 
and labeling, um, flagging that critical value of um, x equals negative one half. Now I'm going to evaluate um, my first derivative in each um, piece of the number line. So in that interval for all numbers less than um, negative one half, I'm going to use negative one. Plugging that into my first derivative, I get a positive value. So if my first derivative is positive, my original function is increasing. Then I'm going to plug in a number greater than negative one half. I'm going to choose zero into my first derivative and simplify that I get a negative number. If my first derivative is negative, my original function is decreasing. Now it asks us to find our local extrema, so I'm increasing and then decreasing. So that means I have a local maximum at this critical value of negative one half. Now that I figured out I had a local maximum, I need to find the y value of my maximum by plugging in that negative one half into my original function. and I get 9 fourths. So I have a local maximum at the point negative 1 half and um, comma 9 fourths. And that's all you do using the first derivative test to find your local extremus. Next we're going to learn about the concavity of a um, function. Now first let's define what concavity is. Concavity is the curvature of the graph. So on this first two pictures I have concave up. Always, I remember, how I remember the two is you, you're concave up, you're smiley face. So I have a small, and that's concave up, you can breathe in the HCU. Now if you're frowning, you're concave down. So those two t um, graphs, and you're only going to see pieces of these. You're usually not going to see the two together, or won't always see the two together. So that's concave down. Now later on, we're going to be able to identify these in more detail. For example, this is this left-hand side is, concave, is decreasing concave up and then increasing concave down. My third little piece is increasing concave down. And my last piece is decreasing concave down. That'll come in more important when we get to our next lesson. But um, today we're just going to focus on finding concavity, just concave up and concave down. So how do we find concavity? Well, concavity is actually found by our second derivative. It tells us about the concavity of the graph. So if your second derivative is greater than zero, a positive value, then the graph is concave upwards on that interval. So if the second derivative is positive, that interval is concave up. If the second derivative is negative, then the interval is concave downwards on that, then your, then your graph is concave downward on that interval. Okay. If you, um, at the point where you switch from concave up to concave down, that is called an inflection point, or it's also referred to as a point of inflection, abbreviated POI. Um, POI. And this is where you switch from concave up to concave down, or concave down to concave up. Okay, it's called a point of inflection. Now, the best way to find your point, your concavity is to do a second sign chart. And this is the sign chart for concavity. So it's going to be very similar to the one we did before, except this time we're going to flag on um, the values where our second derivative is zero. So this time it's where our second derivative is equal to zero, or undefined. And then that's the numbers we're going to flag. Those are our x values. And then above that, we're going to talk about our second derivative. And we're going to put if our second derivative is positive or negative. And then once we figure out if our second derivative is positive or negative, we're going to translate that to what that tells us about our original function. So if the second derivative is negative, that tells me our original function is concave down. If my second derivative is positive, it tells me our original function is concave up. Now, since on this first flag, I switch from concave up to concave down, that critical value, that number, it's not a critical value. That number is called a point of inflection. The other flag is not a point of inflection because I didn't switch concavities. So let's try one. We're going to find the intervals of concavity and all points of inflection for this function. And I'm going to limit this to the to from 0 to 2 pi on the closed interval from 0 to 2 pi. Just to make it a little bit easier, we don't have to do that plus 2 in pi kind of thing when we're figuring it out that you did in trig. So step one is we need to find our second derivative. So we're going to start by finding our first derivative. So I'm going to differentiate this function. I get co cosine of x minus sine of x. Then I'm going to differentiate once again and get negative sine of x minus cosine of x. And then I need to figure out when that derivative is equal to um, 0 because it always, it, it always exists. And the easiest way to think of this is I'm going to use my unit circle and I'm going to figure out when is negative sine of x equal to cosine of x. So remember from our unit circle, um, Sine, we know that sine and cosine are equal at pi over 4. But now I need to figure out which quadrants 
is um, do I have a negative sign and a positive cosine or which one would that work um, where they are opposite signs and that would happen in notice that occurs in quadrants um, two and quadrants four so I need to find the angles in quadrants two and quadrants four that has a reference angle of pi over four because we know that's that's the angle in the unit circle that has the same um, sine and cosine value square root of two over two all right, so remember in quadrant two, to find your reference angle, you take pi minus, I mean, find your original angle, you take pi minus your reference angle, and so that gives me three pi over four. And then in quadrant four, to find your original angle, you take two pi minus your reference angle. Which gives us seven pi over four. So those are my numbers that I'm going to put on, I'm going to flag on my sec, on this um, sign chart. I, I don't need arrows on it because I'm limiting my domain to 0 to 2 pi. I said that earlier. So I'm going to put closed interval here so dots not extending it out. All right, so um, those are my key points I'm going to flag. So I've now divided my number line into three segments. I need to figure out if my um, second derivative is positive or negative. So this notice why the labeling is so important. This tells me which sign chart you're doing. If you're doing the first derivative sign chart or the second derivative sign chart. So I need to pick a number between 0 and um, 3 pi over 4, um, so I could pick any one I want. I choose pi over 4. Um, you could have chose something different. And I'm going to plug that back into my second derivative equation, which is negative sine of x minus cosine. Using my unit circle knowledge, I remember sine of pi over 4 square root of 2 over 2, so that's negative square root of 2 over 2 minus square root of 2 over 2, which gives us obviously a negative value. And so if my second derivative is negative, that tells me my original function is concave down. Now I'm going to pick a number in, in between 3 pi over 4 and 7 pi over 4. Again, you have many choices. I'm going to choose pi. Evaluating the second derivative at pi. Remember, our sine of pi is 0. Our cosine is negative 1. So negative, negative, positive, which gives me a positive value. So therefore, I am concave up. Then I'm going to choose a number um, in between 7 pi over 4 and 2 pi. Now that's a closed interval in this case. I'm including the 2 pi, so I'm going to evaluate the second derivative at 2 pi just because that's an easy number to work with. You could have chose anything um, in that quadrant 4 greater than 7 pi over 4. Plugging 2 pi into my, uh, my second derivative, I get a negative value. So this interval is concave down. So I now can identify my intervals in which the function is, um, the intervals are concave down, which will be on the closed interval from 0 to 3 pi over 4. This is one of the few exceptions where I'm going to use a bracket and not a parenthesis since I'm doing a closed interval and I'm including that endpoint there. And we know from our trig graph that the graph will continue on and that's not going to be a max for min at those endpoints. And concave up will be on the interval from um, 3 pi over 4 to 7 pi over 4. Last but not least, I need now to figure out our all points of inflection. Well, points of inflection was I switch from concave up to concave down. Well, that occurs at 3 pi over 4 and also at 7 pi over 4. So there are two points of inflection here. Now, to figure out the y value of these points of inflection, I need to plug in these x values into the original function, f of x this time. Make sure you switch functions. So that means I need to find the sine of 3 pi over 4 and add that to the, sine, the cosine of 3 pi over 4. Okay, all of these, um, the pi over 4, so they have the square root of 2 over 2, just depending on which quadrant they're in, they'll be positive or negative. And again, remember 3 pi over 4 is in quadrant 2, where cosine is negative and sine is positive. So that's going to give me square root of 2 over 2, plus a negative square root of 2 over 2, which is 0. So I have a point of inflection at 3 pi over 4, comma, 0. My next point of inflection, I'm going to evaluate at um, 7 pi over 4 into my original function. Remember, this is in quadrant 4, and in quadrant 4, our... Um, Cosine is positive and our sine is negative. And that just happens to give us zero as well. So that is another point of inflection. Now we've found all parts of this problem. Okay, you try the next one. All right, so to find the intervals of concavity and all points of inflection, we need to find our second derivative. So we must find our first derivative and then differentiate it to get our second derivative. Then this is a polynomial, so it always exists. So all you have to worry about is when it equals zero which is at 1. So I'm going to do my sign chart, flagging the number 1. And again, remember, I'm going to plug it into my second derivative to figure out what's happening with my original function. So plugging in um, 0 into my second derivative, 
I get, I get a negative value. So since my second derivative is negative, my original function must be concave up. I mean, sorry, concave down. Negative is concave down. Okay, and now I'm gonna test a point greater than one, so I'm gonna choose two, and when I plug that in, I get a positive value. So if my second derivative is positive, my original function is concave up. So I can now figure out my intervals in which the function is concave down, negative infinity to one, and the intervals in which the function is concave up, one to infinity. I also have a point of inflection. Since I switched concavity at one, I have a point of inflection at one comma. Well, I need to figure out that y value, so I plug in one into my original function to get y. And I get a value of two. So I have a point of inflection or an inflection point at one comma two. Okay, next thing I'm going to do is something called a second derivative test. Now, a second derivative test is another way of finding your relative max and mins. Um, you usually do this when we don't have to go through all the parts of finding the intervals of increasing or decreasing. You want to start the same way of finding your critical numbers. Remember, your critical numbers when your first derivative is equal to zero or does not exist. Then you're going to find your second, then you're going to evaluate your second derivative at each of those critical numbers. If the second derivative is negative, you have a local maximum at that critical number. If your second derivative is positive, you have a local minimum at that critical number. All right. One thing to note about the second derivative test, it is much faster when you don't need to know about your intervals of increasing or decreasing your local, um, you just need your local extremis, but the problem is it doesn't work every time. If your second derivative is also zero or does not exist, as well as your at those critical values, the second derivative test is inconclusive. And um, so you can't, you might have a local max, you might have a local min, you might not have either, you don't know. And so you have to figure it out by doing the second derivative test. So you have to go back to that second derivative, the first derivative test that we did at the beginning. So second derivative test, is usually faster, but it does not work every time, and it does not work when the um, second derivative is zero or does not exist. All right, so to do this, we're going to start by finding, uh, remember, the second derivative test is you need to find your second derivative. So I'm first going to find my first derivative. Oh, let's find, let's simplify this first. All right, so we're going to figure out our first derivative. Now, some people like to go and find the second derivative right away. If you want to, let's find the second derivative. I'll do it this way, and then I'll do it another way in the next example. And so we get our second derivative of 8x to the negative 3, which can be rewritten as 8 divided by x cubed. All right, now, what numbers do I plug into that second derivative? Well, your critical numbers. So, I, so we need to go back to our first derivative and figure out when that first derivative equals 0, it does not exist. So I'm going to rewrite it as well. Set that equal to 0. I'm going to add the 4 um, divided by x squared. And I get x is equal to plus or minus 2. Now, I'm not going to, in this case, set it equal to where it does not exist because um, it does not exist at 0, but 0 is not in the domain of my original function, so I don't have to worry about it. So now I'm going to plug in those critical numbers into my second derivative. I really don't care what this number is. I just want to know if it's a positive number or negative. It's a negative number. So when the second derivative is negative, that tells us we have a maximum point. Then I'm going to plug in 2 into my second derivative and check and see what I get. I got a positive value. So since that is positive, it gives me a local minimum. So again, negative tells us we have a local maximum at that point, negative 2 comma something. We got to figure out that y value. Positive for the second derivative in the second derivative test says I have a local minimum. And so to find my local max or min, I just plug in those critical numbers into our original function. So I have a local minimum at the point 2, negative 1, and now I'm going to plug in negative 2 into my original equation. And I have a local maximum at negative 2, negative 9. Now you might be thinking, wait, wait, your maximum has a smaller y, a smaller y value than your minimum? Well, remember this is a rational function. We have a couple pieces of our curves on a rational function. That is actually a local max and a local min. If you're not sure, you might want to sketch this to kind of prove it to yourself. All right, I want you to try this next one. I want you to use a second derivative test. So again, I showed you that it was two ways I can do this. So first way is just to find the critical number first. So I just find my first derivative. Um, it's a polynomial, so it always exists. I set that first derivative equal to zero to find my critical values. I'm going to factor out my GCF of um, 4 to the x, and that gives me um, a difference of squares. And so my critical values are x equals 0, x equals 2, and x equals negative um, 2. So I have three critical numbers here. And so I need to plug those critical numbers into my second derivative. So we need to find our second derivative. So um, I'm going to differentiate our first derivative here and get our second derivative as 12x squared minus 16. And then I'm going to plug in negative 2 into that second derivative. And I really, again, don't care about what the number is. I just care if it's a positive number or negative. 
So negative two squared gives me a positive number times 12 is very much bigger than 16. So that tells me I'm gonna have a number greater than zero or a positive value there. Now when I plug in, um, and so again, when you have a positive value for your second derivative test, that means you have a minimum. Okay, I'm gonna plug in zero and I end up with a maximum. And when my second derivative at two gives me a negative value, I'm sorry, positive value, so I have another minimum. So now I need to figure out my y value at each of those critical points. So I'm gonna plug in my critical points into my original function. And I get negative six. So, and then I'm gonna plug in zero into my original function to get 10. And then I'm gonna plug two into my original function. And I get negative six. So I have a minimum value at the point negative two, negative six, a maximum value at the point zero, 10, and a minimum value at the point two, six. All right, now we're gonna put all of this together in one problem. This is preparing us for our next section. So I want you to find all the pieces that we've learned so far. So we're gonna start by finding our critical, num our critical um, points. So remember, to find our critical points, we need to first find our first derivative. So finding our first derivative, I then figure out when my derivative does not exist, it's polynomial, so it always exists, so all I need to do is figure out when that first derivative is equal to zero. And that will occur when x is equal to plus or minus three. So my critical um, points, all right, x is equal to plus or minus three, are critical numbers. All right, now to find our intervals of increasing and decreasing, I need to do a sign chart. So I'm gonna set up a sign chart at, um, and flag the critical numbers. I have divided this number line to three sections, so I need to pick a x value less than negative three. I'll choose negative four and plug that into my derivative. All right, so that is, wait, I need to plug in negative four, not negative three. All right, so that's gonna give me a positive, because three is positive, times positive inside the parentheses, so that gives us a positive value. And when my first derivative is positive, my original function is increasing. Then I'm gonna plug in um, something in between negative three and three, which I'll choose zero, which gives us um, a negative value, which means our original function is decreasing. And something greater than three, I'll choose four, which gives us a positive value, so our function is increasing. So the intervals in which our function increasing is negative infinity to negative three, union with three to infinity. Our intervals in which our function is decreasing is from negative three to three. Now I need to find the intervals of concave up and concave down. So that means I need to find the second derivative. So I'm gonna go back to my first derivative and differentiate it. And I get six X, that's a polynomial, it always exists. So I just need to figure out when it equals zero, which is at zero. So I do my second sign chart where my, I flag the point zero. I choose an X value less than zero and plug that into my second derivative. So this is my second derivative sign chart. Okay, plugging negative one into my second derivative, I get a negative value. So if my second derivative is negative, my original function is concave down. Plugging in um, one into my second derivative, I get a positive value, and if my second derivative is positive, my original function is concave up. So therefore, my intervals of concave up is from zero to infinity, intervals from concave down is negative infinity to zero. I did switch from concave down to concave up at zero, so zero um, is the x value of our inflection point. To find the y value, I plug zero back into the original function which was x cubed minus 27x, and I get zero. So I have a flexion point at zero, zero. Last but not least, I'm gonna find my local extrema points. Remember, I go back to my first sign chart, and when it's increasing, draw arrows up. When it's decreasing, draw arrows down. So it looks like negative three is a maximum, and three is a minimum. Okay, so we're gonna find our extremas to find our local maximum, which I identified is gonna be at negative three. I'm gonna plug in negative three into my original function. So that'll give me negative three cubed minus 27 times negative three. And I get 54. So I have a local uh, maximum at negative 354. Now to find my local minimum, I'm gonna plug three back into my original function. And I get negative 54. So in conclusion, our local extremas, we have a local maximum at the point negative three comma 54 and we have a local minimum at the point 
3 comma negative 54.